Well, I was really excited to get this in the post this week. Uh, the day the revolution began. And it's got a very funky cover. I'm really impressed by this. And yeah. uh, it, I, I was, it's hard I was, to read it, actually. I was but. surprised. I mean, obviously, putting revolution backwards like that makes it look sort of vaguely Russian or Cyrillic or yeah, something. Yeah. It was revolutionary. But also, they're very clever because it's got L-O-V-E obviously oh, in the middle nice. there. Yeah, you, yeah. you didn't spot that? I didn't <laughs> spot that. That's terrible. Well, that was, <laughs> that was the whole point. Um, but uh, the, the theme of the book, which this picks up on, and actually that title wasn't my idea. It was the American publisher who thought, mm. yeah, is that when we talk about the atonement, we often think about so many different ideas about God and us being reconciled, etc. Mm. But at the heart of what the New Testament says about the death of Jesus, is this very strange belief that by the evening of the first Good Friday, the world was a different place. Mm. And nobody realized that until Easter Day. Mm. And then suddenly said, oh my goodness, but what Easter made them do was to reflect that something had happened when Jesus mm. died on the cross, as a result of which new creation could begin. The new life of Jesus, but the whole sense of a new world being born and new life for people, etc. And so the task of this book is not to do a complete theology of atonement, which would require a lot of other themes mm. about sacrifice and about ascension and all sorts of things, but to say on the basis of the New Testament, so by the evening of the first Good Friday, what has changed and how? Mm. And so in particular, the New Testament, particularly John and Paul, emphasized that on the cross, Jesus won some kind of a victory. Mm. And one of the reasons that many Christians find this hard to get their heads around is because the theme of the kingdom of God is kind of remote to people today, mm. of God becoming king in a new way. Um, I used to say to people, to walk into a youth group, say, what would it look like if God was in charge here? People say, uh, we might have better coffee for a start, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, sometimes used to do that in local communities, host a meeting on what would Darlington look like if God was mm. running it. And th that's a good question to ask. And Jesus is asking that question throughout the gospels and the evangelists are saying, this is what it looks like, look what he's doing, but then as he goes to the cross, mm. king of the Jews above his head. What does that mean? It means that there is a victory of love being won over all the forces of hatred, because in the gospels you find all the wickedness of the world, whether it's Herod killing mm. the babies or demons shrieking in the synagogue or Pharisees plotting behind the scenes. And it's as though the way the gospels tell the story is that it's not only the story of Israel, the story of creation, the story of Jesus. It's the story of evil doing its worst and closing in mm. on Jesus, but somehow Jesus' death wins the victory over that power of evil, which means that now all the other things that God wants to happen can happen. Evil has been defeated, and it's defeated through Jesus as, in the technical language, being the representative substitute. And people have often in later theology mm. taken these ideas of victory or representative or substitute, mm. and they've played them off against one yeah. another. The gospels don't do that. They all come rushing together. So I'm trying to explore what the gospels and Paul are saying mm. about the death of Jesus, partly in order to say to the church, look, let's not have the fight between this and that and the other theory. Mm. Let's look at the actual story, which is of a revolution of love which was launched on that day mm. and which we now are charged with continuing. So that's, that's, what, that's what the book's about. Oh, I'm looking forward to reading <laughs> good, it. Good, good. I, I was surprised that you wrote it um, because one of the things I picked up from how God became king mm. um, was the, the feeling that we've overemphasized the cross to the neglect of the resurrection and the yeah. incarnation. That's, so that's, here's a book about the cross. That's, that's absolutely true um, that many Christians would find it perfectly all right if Jesus had been born of a virgin and died on a cross and yeah. never done anything else in between. And well, the resurrection is just sort of happy ending. Mm. And you need the bigger picture. Mm. But once you've got the bigger picture, then there's all sorts of new things which you can see about the cross. Mm. And the cross is so massive that actually almost anything you'd start to say about it mm. probably finds a purchase somewhere. Yeah. The danger as with other things is if you get one little bit of it and think that's the whole, then that will distort it. Mm. And what I say in the book is there's a kind of a sequence. We have, as I say, platonized our vision of the end. That is to say, we've imagined that the purpose of being a Christian is to get your soul to go to heaven. Mm. And that's actually what Platonism was saying in the first century. It's not what Christianity mm. was saying. Christianity is about God rescuing creation, new heavens and new earth and resurrection. Mm. 
But the result of that is we've thought about what it means to be human in terms of God actually setting the human race a moral exam. Here's a very high bar and you've got to jump and we all miss it. We all fail the exam. So God's very cross and has to punish us. And then fortunately Jesus gets in the way. And that's not entirely wrong, but what actually happens in Genesis 1 and 2 is that the human beings have a vocation. Mm. They are to be image bearers, to reflect God into the world and the praises of the world back to God. And that includes morality, but it's much bigger than that. Mm. So if you moralize what it means to be human, actually, like Adam and Eve in the garden, you're putting the knowledge of good and evil at mm. the center of your menu. Mm. And that's not a good thing to do. But then if you make those two moves, think about souls going to heaven and then think about whether we behaved or not as the key thing, then you will find that your description of the cross suffers as a result. And that's often happened in church history. Yeah. So that's really what I'm pushing back against mm. and trying to do a bigger biblical picture. Mm. Um, and for me, this is quite a journey because I actually, in the course of writing this book, I changed my mind about some key passages, uh, including the very central one of Romans chapter three, verses 21 to 26, which is really one of the central things. Mm. And wrestling with it, oh my goodness, yeah, it actually comes apart this way. Mm. And we put it together that way. And uh, that was that was quite a quite a revolution in my thinking. Wow! Oh, I'm looking forward to reading that. My my first ever sermon I gave in a church was on Romans three. Oh goodness! And uh, I, I think I used the illustration of a of a young woman who's just got engaged and she's got her engagement ring on, and um, you know she's just trying to catch the diamond in different lights in order to kind of appreciate mm -hmm. it more. Mm -hmm. And I felt that Paul was layering his pictures of the cross. You know, you've got you've got redemption haven't you that we're being liberated you've got atonement um, and and you've also got um forgiveness going on but are you are you saying that they are they are supposed to be all seen <laughs> together or are they just different facets no they, they are supposed to be seen together and it's better to glimpse the facets than not to glimpse them as it were mm. to imagine there's only one facet however the story that paul is telling really from romans chapter 2 verse 17 through to the end of chapter 4 is about God's purpose for Israel and the way in which that purpose is accomplished through the Messiah and his obedient, faithful death. Mm. And the way that that then accomplishes God's faithfulness to Israel and to the whole creation. When you run at it like that, then all sorts of things in the passage fall into place in a new way. And I haven't said half of it there, but I know some people will say, well, Paul takes an image from the law court, another image from the mm. sacrificial temple and this and that and the other. And yeah, they're all there, but actually there is a single sustained mm. in-depth narrative in which they aren't just a jumble of images. They actually make a full and flowing sense. But, but one has to realize that in reading Romans, you can't just take chapters one to four. Chapters one to four demand that you go on to, into five to eight. And it's in chapter eight verses one to four mm. that you have the central statement, which is there is no condemnation for those in the Messiah mm. because in the Messiah, God condemned sin in the flesh. Um, that is penal condemnation. That is substitutionary. Mm. He condemned sin there, so there is no condemnation for us. But he doesn't say, God punished Jesus. He says God condemned sin mm. in the flesh of Jesus. He's telling the same story as the Gospels when they see evil heaped up and dumped on Jesus mm. and God is dealing with it mm. there. That's a huge and mysterious and kind of dangerous idea. But it seems to me if you approach it like that, all sorts of things which puzzle people and sometimes worry people about Christian preaching about the cross can be seen in a new light. Brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to Thank reading you. it. Could I just say as well? Yeah. I don't know if your viewers know this, but I'm doing some online courses, hmm. which they'll find at www.ntwriteonline.org and launched this week as well as the book, hmm. there is a new course based on the book. Oh, great. Um, so if people want to, to yeah. have it as a study kit, and there's other courses as well on hmm. Romans and Galatians and goodness knows and, what. And how do they work? You watch some video and you ask some questions? Um, there, there's a sequence of short videos, basically 15 and 20 minutes, um, I forget how many there are for this, maybe 12 or something uh, of those short videos. And then there's written material that goes with that, which a colleague in America has put together and uh, uh, a sort of study guide and then a website to, to share with other people who are doing the course and so on. Fascinating. Brilliant. Well, thank you for writing this. And, thank you. And on behalf of many of my <laughs> viewers, uh, thank you for filling up a, a whole shelf in my house. <laughs> that you've just uh, Your writing has provoked and encouraged and spurred us on to kind of 
dig deeper into scripture and to see well, fresh things. So that's, thank you. that's the main thing. Thank you.